to the academics and those associated with the school, I really want to thank you because our interests are commonly aligned. Our challenge is how do we attract the best talent, how do we develop and deploy that talent, and how do we enhance that talent's success? And that starts in the classroom and the various programs that you all put in place here, but once they leave your doors, they come into our doors. And again, the mission statement is very much aligned, so I do appreciate everything that you do for us as well. To the students, this time is for you. The next hour and a half, of which I'm going to dedicate a lot of time for Q&A, is for you. What I'll share with you is a little bit of my background. I'll give you some context, because you're probably saying to yourself as you sit here, who is this person and can I be them at some point in time? And I want to give you some perspective on my career path so you understand the art of the possible for you all. I then want to talk about what we see happening from a corporate perspective, both for ourselves as well as the organization that we interact with. And that includes the combination of private companies, public companies, government, and the like. And underlying all of that, what are some of the key trends that enable organizations broadly defined to be successful? And I'll call some of them out because it also relates to how ultimately you can be successful. And I do want to come back at the end of this because my broad discussion is around technology, leadership, and you. With a sprinkling in each one of these things of the mindset that we all should have as individuals, the mindset that we should have as organizations to leverage technology, leadership, and you to be successful. Like I said at the end, I am going to open up for questions. We'll try to figure out how to do that with some of the overflow rooms. But please, as my PwC colleagues know, I will answer anything and everything, so don't be shy. Take advantage of the opportunity. Like I said, the opportunity is to take advantage of this time with me today. Let me start with a little bit of a career path. So again, you're all sitting here in this fine institution saying to yourself, you know, what's my job opportunity to look like as I go through the many years that I've got to go through to be successful, and then will there be a job opportunity for me afterwards? So let me start with sort of where I was if I put myself in your shoes. So yeah, I did graduate in 1985 is when I started with PwC. I actually went to a small state school. My grades weren't great. I was the first kid at home to actually go to college. In fact, I almost never went. Believe it or not, I worked at a women's clothing store in the stock room. That's where I started. <laughs> and my father was the one that took me aside literally a couple months before college was scheduled to start because my mindset at the time was, Dad, I'm not going. Maybe I need to take a year of work for a little while before I decide to go to college. And as a first generation person, from his perspective, that ever went to college, he said, no way in hell you're not going. <laughs> and the rest from there is history. Now, why did I end up going to, one, this college, and two, into this profession from a major perspective? Again, I majored business administration with a focus on accounting. It was for one reason and one reason only. When I was literally a junior in high school, I read the New York Times and read that partners made $90,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good to me. My SAT scores were okay on the math, not so great on the English. Sounds like a place for me. Don't know what I'm doing, don't know what it's going to be like, but why not give it a shot? And I went through college doing fairly well in the first couple of years. I probably met a few too many people in a few too many bars in the last couple of years. And the grade point average was OK. I ended up trying to interview for a number of different organizations, primarily again in that accounting space, that finance space. My father worked at IBM, got me an internship in my junior year, between junior and senior year. So the choice for me was, at the time, Big E versus IBM. And what was really interesting during that time was which way do I want to go? Because my mindset was actually, you know what, this CPA thing, whatever it may be, let's get certified, let's get in, and let's get out. And the reason I chose to go to PwC as opposed to IBM was that it would be easier for me to go to PwC and leave and then go to IBM as opposed to the other way around. <laughs> That's how much foresight I had on my career path. And I was asked the question early on, you know, around goal setting, and did you aspire to be the person you are? And the answer is absolutely not. My thought process was get certified and get out. And that's exactly what the mindset was when I showed up. I remember going through my interview process. 
when I was going to PwC, I had an ugly brown seer suit. It's the only thing I could afford. I went down and did the campus interview like you have here. I did it in the office interview and the like. And it wasn't until years later, when I actually made a partner, that I understood why I got the job. There was an individual by the name of George John. George was the lead recruiter at the time. And I spent time with George, and I went through the interview process, and upon the day I made an admission to the partnership, George came up to me and said, hey, Bob, congratulations. You probably don't remember me, but I was the guy that interviewed you. I said, George, no, I do remember you. He goes, do you know why you were hired? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sure it wasn't because of the suit. <laughs> He goes, the reality was, I looked at your resume, and your grade point average was okay. It wasn't great. You had a couple of activities, not a lot, but yeah, okay. But when you had hobbies down at the bottom, I noticed a number of different things, including martial arts. And I remember when you walked into my office, the first thing I said after I looked at the ugly brown suit was the ugly brown boots you were wearing. <laughs> <laughs> so when I left that interview, Bob, the reason I gave you the job is because I thought you were going to kick the you-know-what out of me and then hire you. Know, <laughs> and it is to this day that that literally was the recruiting process that I went through. I joined PwC in 1985. I started right away. First couple of years, again, I didn't know what I was doing. It was extremely hard to understand the bigger picture and what was going on. And I remember again to this day, the first training class I went to, Patty Lettieri, the woman next to me, had all the answers. I felt like an idiot. Patty knew everything. It was about a week into the training that I finally went to Patty and I said, let's go to lunch. And I asked Patty at lunch, I said, how do you know all this stuff? Because I'm just not getting it. And Patty turned around and said, I intern. And I interned at PwC, not at IBM. So I understand this stuff. And literally my career path from then on was get through the first couple of years and then get out. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, that second or third year, I was recruited to an outside organization. I went for the interview, didn't take the job. And it was at that point in time that ultimately I tried to figure out, and I did figure out, what is it the role that I am playing? Am I good at it? How can I be an expert? And yes, then it finally makes sense in terms of the contributions you can make in an organization. Now, what was interesting is I actually, in years three through five, did fairly well. Got promoted early. I actually went into HR in our New York office in, 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 in our location. People left the practice serving clients as an auditor, which is what I was in the financial services space, and actually did HR responsibilities, which was great. Gave you a different perspective of the business. Gave you the human element of the business. And you heard what was going on, why were people leaving, who was hooking up with who, all kinds <laughs> of stuff. <laughs> But it did give you a different perspective of how do you actually think about the business, not in terms of how we serve our clients and investors and the boards, but how do you serve the needs of our people. And it was a, about a year later, I was asked to go over to Japan. I went there for about three and a half years. Now remember, here I am as a kid coming out of a high school, small state university, never had a passport. And went over to Japan for three and a half years. I was just married at the time. So the first six months were great. It was an extended honeymoon. We were exploring everything. And then reality hit in terms of, man, i got to get some work done here. And I had a chance to see a different perspective of the world from what you only read about sitting here in the States. And it was mind-blowing to me, because this was 1991, the kind of letters you got from people. And yes, it was letters at that time. It wasn't the same time messages or the Facebooks or the Skyping or anything else going on. But it was the letters in terms of, hey, you know, I heard you're going to Hong Kong. You know, it's a two-hour drive, isn't it? Well, no, it's actually like a six-hour flight over an ocean, guys. You know, wake up. But it did give you a perspective in terms of the myopic world that some of the people in the U.S. actually had. And again, it was opening for eye-opening for me to understand different cultures, different perspectives. First year was focused on Japan. Next couple of years, because of the clients I worked on, was focused on the region. So I had a chance to go into Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, Australia, Thailand, backdoor into China. And again, wide open in terms of the experiences. And one of the major lessons learned that I'll give you is you think about your own path. And I don't mean career path, but it's personal as much as professional. Is the network that you create. While I was in Japan, the people that I met, not just in my own organization, but in clients, or just socially, that ended up being CFOs or CEOs of organizations, or even within PwC, 
leaders that I now in my role today have to interact with literally was based on relationships that we started 20 some odd years ago while we were both at a relatively low level in Japan. And you've got to remember that the people that are sitting right now to the left and to the right of you are a potential network, personally or professionally, that at some point in time you may want to link into, connect with, leverage, whatever the case may be. That was a huge lesson for me that at the time didn't sink in. And some of the lessons that I'll give you as we go through this a little bit later on are upon reflection because at times you will not see those lessons right in front of your eyes. It's only later when you really appreciate what's going on and the benefits that came from them. I actually went through a series of promotions. I came back to state. I worked in the financial services space. I worked in a lot of the large clients that we had in the firm in that space. I eventually took on a leadership role running our financial services business. And it was an interesting, again, inflection point because at that point in time is when Anderson went down. And some of the reporting issues came up when you looked at Enron, WorldCom, and the like. And the lesson learned in that one for me was how many times I looked around and met with Anderson people that lost everything. We were trying to recruit their people to join our firm. And when you sit against somebody else that worked in an institution that had a great reputation, and you heard the stories around the lack of communication in some cases, or losing everything, it gives you a different perspective of the fiduciary responsibilities that you have in protecting an organization. And literally to have partners with tears in your eyes across the table from you understanding what's going on. The second lesson I learned during that cycle goes back to something we just celebrated. Celebrated is a wrong choice of words, but if you think about it for a second, it was a tragic event. Let's talk about the celebratory piece of this thing. It was 9-11. 9-11 was a tra traumatic experience for me. Why? I literally was recently the financial services leader. We have a big financial services practice. We have hundreds of people in the World Trade Center, or had hundreds of people in the World Trade Center. I happened to be at a training session across the river in New Jersey at the time it happened. Actually saw the second plane hit and then saw the towers come down. And now all of a sudden, this is when leadership skills kick in. Forget the debits and the credits. Forget the tax code or the accounting or reporting code. All of a sudden, you've got people around you saying, what's going on? What do we do? And all eyes are on you. And there is no textbook. There is no classroom that will tell you what to do. And the challenge and the lessons learned there, this is where instincts have to kick in. This is when the, the social graces have to kick in. This is when the emotional gut feel starts to kick in. Because not only do you need to give a message to the people that are right there in front of you that don't know if their brothers and sisters are alive, that are actually trying to connect with my people back in the office to find out how we're going to track everybody down because I don't know how many people we might have just lost. Or what we should be doing because New York is closing down. On top of that, for days after, how do we track down every single one of our people? And as a leader, at what point in time do you call mom and dad and say, I haven't heard from Sharon or Tony, have you? Unbelievable in terms of what we try to do. Now, we ultimately didn't lose anybody in the tower, believe it or not. A lot of people were at these training courses. Some that were in the building got out. We did lose five people in the plane, though. <coughs> Again, we're a global organization. A lot of people traveling everywhere. So five of our employees were in those planes that went down. But again, it was another reflection as to how do you actually shape what you do today compared to the experiences you've had in the past. As I think about the career path I've had, I've been tremendously fortunate, lucky, by choice or otherwise. And I've had the benefit of having great sponsors put me in opportunities to succeed, give me the leash to actually do it move the wall forward. So if I'm sitting now in your shoes and I go back to 1985, did I ever think I'd be a partner at PwC? No. Even though that $90,000 felt pretty good. Did I think I was going to be leading PwC? Absolutely not. Did I think I'd actually meet the last three presidents? Did I think I'd actually be sitting down with Secretary Geithner? Did I think I'd actually walk the red carpet because we count the Oscars? <laughs> no, it's a all of the above. But that is the art of the possible that each and every one of you have as you think about your own career paths and what you're doing here today. Because believe me, with my grade point average and the way I came out of school, trust me, if I could do what I've done, 
believe me, you're in a better position than I am to be successful, but the choice is yours and it's a two-way street. I'll come back to that in a couple seconds. So let's shift gears for a second. And I talked to you about that stuff to give you some context to ask any questions you want about career craft and otherwise. Let's come back at it from another way though, which is what do we see day in and day out from the business community perspective right now? And as you look over the last couple of years in particular, and you look forward the next couple of years, there is a continued malaise, chaos, uncertainty that is going to continue. And that goes to the CEOs that are trying to run organizations, that goes to the politicians that are trying to figure everything out, that is the service organizations like us. And underlying all of this, the differentials between the winners and the losers, both at a corporate level as well as an individual level, again, we'll come back to this concept of leadership, technology, and again, this mindset. Now let me share exactly what I mean. If you look over the last couple of years, let's take the issue of technology to start with. Technology has always been thought of as an enabler. It's impacted tremendously what people do and how they do it. But it's never been more impactful than the last decade. When you think about the computing power that is out there in terms of how fast it's increased, when you think about the digitalization of everything and anything that's accessible to people, when you think about the connectivity not just here in this classroom or in this auditorium or the rooms outside, but globally. It is unbelievable to see the impact that technology has had. You can go to the effectiveness and efficiencies of the organizations that have done a great job of restructuring the balance sheet and taking costs out. Why? Because they leverage technology faster and better than ever before. You can go to the things that happened in the Middle East and the social unrest for all the good cause that ultimately they were trying to accomplish, again, coming back to social media. You can look in our own organization when you think about our people in China and the connectivity between the staff that's sitting in Baltimore or Washington and the connectivity and the knowledge that they have all the way around the world that's accessible in a heartbeat. Those are the things that actually, if thought about in the right way, with the right mindset, are tremendously valuable. Now, what do I mean by that? There's many people out there right now that would argue this next generation of talent is so connected to technology. They're not going to do things the way we used to do it. They're just not going to have the social reaches and the skill sets needed to do business the way we did business. Why are people always on the computer? Why are they always doing it at the same time? Why are they always got their heads down on their mobile devices? And there's a little bit of anxiety when you think about that older generation of people compared to the younger generation. In case A, if you've got the wrong mindset, you're actually trying to squash that. You're trying to do things the way they were done before. And there are many people out there, including CEOs, management teams, and the like, in government and in the private space, that would say, how do you actually change this? because they're never going to be able to do the things that we were able to do because they're not going to learn the way we did. Here's the mindset shift, people. If you think about that as a huge asset, it is tremendously powerful and tremendously empowering to you as an individual, to the organizations that leverage it, and to the benefits that will come to the bottom line, the top line, the brand of the organizations at all. Now, what do I mean by that? A lot of people today will argue this next generation of students, you all, won't study as much, won't memorize the rules and regulations. When you think about our space, accounting, tax, regulation. Why? Because you don't need to. That knowledge is available and accessible in a heartbeat. Just Google. Look on the YouTube and take a look at the instructional video that's coming across. The ability to actually tap into that is unbelievably powerful for you and your own personal brand if leveraged in the right way, as well as the organization themselves if they actually tap into that. Encourage that and actually make it a competitive asset versus the competition. Now why do I say that? If you look at our client base today, and we interact with companies worldwide, big, small, doesn't matter, there is a huge differentiation that's starting to happen. Those that will actually survive and thrive regardless of the economic cycle, and those that are going to muddle along. What are they doing differently? They're absolutely staying focused on long-term strategy. 
They're absolutely focused on the consumer, the ultimate consumer, and where the growth is going to come from. They're focused on leveraging technology to be smarter, faster, better, making decisions, tapping into knowledge, connecting the supply chain. They're absolutely dead set on focus around people and talent management. And yes, they're actually differentiating a lot of the noise that's in the media today and figuring out what's really important and saying, here's the three things that really matter to me. Those are the ones we're going to focus on. I'll get a trade association to do something else. The other 30, I don't care about. And we're going to do these three things well and make sure we execute as well as possible. And you can see this today when the CEOs that I talked to, and I'll just give you an example. They talked to the CEO of Caterpillar two weeks ago, the CEO of HP, CEO of Symantec, a, a data um, security organization, and one of the CEOs of one of the larger financial institutions. You can see, smell, and detect the difference in terms of the mindset that they have and the half-full mentality versus the half-empty mentality that's out there today. And that half-empty mentality is because of the combination of concerns and uncertainty, the media focus and the like, and some of the data points that are there. But again, if companies do that stuff well, they will survive and thrive and distance themselves from the competition. Now let's talk about what's needed to make that happen. And now I come to this challenge called leadership. I'm going to give you three elements of leadership that are important as we think through the corporate management teams, regardless of title. And I want to make sure you understand the context of why I say it this way. If you think about the business community at large, the first thing to focus on today is globalization. I'm going to come back to that word in a second. The second is actually the interplay between business and government. And the third is around talent management. So let's dissect each one of those for a second. Globalization. I would tell you that the term globalization, the term emerging markets versus developed markets, lousy terms. Sends the wrong connotation. And typically when we talk about that, it's the more developed countries doing well and the emerging countries yet to go. And I will tell you, as you look around the world, travel around the world, it's becoming the opposite. So let's go back to a simple test for a second. I've used this elsewhere. If you thought about the top 20 female billionaires, and ask yourself the question, where do they reside? What do you think the answer is? Asia. So I've heard of the US, I've heard of some of the Europeans, I've heard a little bit of Asia. The top 10 out of the top 20 are actually residing in China. 10 out of the top 20. The largest one being the CEO of a paper recycling company worth about $7 billion. If you go to India and actually look at the financial institutions and the regulatory agencies, they're actually run all by women. If you look at some of the things that are happening in the healthcare space in Africa, in Brazil, China, and India, there's more being done there in simplifying data, supply chain management, and delivering quality health care than we have in the States. Why? Fresh start could be one reason. But the other is, how do we actually mobilize that talent, that workforce, to actually go after a challenge, working with government to make it happen? Tying in that second thing that I just mentioned. But the reality is, there's more opportunities for things that are being learned in the emerging markets than there are perhaps in the developed world. So this connotation of developed versus emerging, strike it from your heads. The issue is around how do you do innovation locally, regardless of where it may, where it may be? How do you tap into that? How do you leverage technology to tap into that? And that's why some of these things are connected. Now let's go to the issue of how do you think about this concept of partnership with government? And if you look on a worldwide basis from a competitive landscape, what we've got going on right now, coming out of the states in particular, is obviously a diversion between the disconnect between government and business. You saw that coming right out of the economic crisis. And you see some of that today, although it's actually waved a little bit more to the middle. But if you look again around the world, and I'll pick on a country like Singapore. Singapore are working between what we call the triple P's, the public-private partnership are working together to say, what is it that we will do to make Singapore a talent magnet 
A magnet for organizations to do things, create innovation, and actually be entrepreneurs, and be successful as the center of excellence around the finance organizations, healthcare organizations, and technology organizations. And business and government working together to make that happen. If you go back to our CEO survey from a couple of years ago, as well as the one that we recently did, we surveyed CEOs, about 15, 1,600 of them, on a worldwide basis. 75% of the CEOs would say that, in fact, what is critical to their survivability is the combination of government and business working together to make things come to life. To create that environment, that infrastructure, that healthcare system, the supply chain around talent and education to be successful. And unfortunately, the worst case scenario when you actually dissect that is the ability and belief that it will happen here in the States versus other countries. Leadership is needed to make that happen. And I'm going to come back to this concept of leadership again in a second. Now go to the issue of talent management. Talent management is a huge, huge enabler, and I will tell you an issue of sustainability for organizations out there. And I'm going to pick on one particular topic, which is diversity, maybe said differently inclusiveness. Business organizations years ago focused on diversity as a legal requirement. Government regulations requiring that X, Y, Z. It has moved to be good business. I will tell you, for those that are doing really well, that will thrive, it's actually an imperative. And the concept has moved away from diversity to inclusiveness. It's happened to talent no matter where it may be. But they have the right mindset to do it. And I want to focus on two elements of this. If you think about the next generation of talent, that's walking in any of these institutions. They don't care what you look like. They don't care what your religion is, your skin color is, your sexual orientation is, or anything else. And the reality is, because again of technology, typically it's literally an email address or a Twitter account name. Let me give you an example. So at PwC, we focus on innovation. Someone asked me the question earlier today, how do you engage your people? There's 35,000 people that you're going to see in the US. You engage them by telling them what our strategy is and you ask them to help. I'm into the job six weeks. I said, number one challenge, how do we increase our revenue pipeline 50% in the next 60 days? And everybody's got a role to play. Second challenge was how do we actually manage cost better? What can we take out of the place to continually invest in our people? Third challenge, What's the latest mobile app that actually will help make your life easier? And the fourth challenge we just went through was what's the next $100 million revenue idea? And what we said to our people was let's have a little fun with this. We've got one rule and one rule only. You've got a team with somebody. Because if you do it solo, that's not a core behavior. We want teamwork. What's going to happen is everybody submit your ideas. The firm's going to vote on the ideas. We're going to narrow the ideas down to 25. The last 25 teams, you're going to get a retired partner, a finance person, and a marketing person to help fill out the business case. We're actually going to do an American Idol exercise to actually allow the firm to vote on the 25 ideas. We'll narrow it down to the five. The five we're going to pitch to the leadership team. And we'll declare the winner right there in front of everybody, the whole 35,000 people. Winner gets 100,000 bucks as well as runs the business going forward. The idea was to leverage the talent in the place, not from the top down, but rather the bottoms up. The idea was to actually do it regardless of any kind of bias or organizational construct. And what was amazing was three things. One, the entire firm got engaged. Literally, almost 70% of the firm was engaged in the process. 70%. Second, there was no focus on diversity or organizational construct. We had an all-female team out of Philadelphia pitching a healthcare idea. Third, through the leverage of technology, we had one of the teams present that never met each other before. Literally, until the day they presented, it was done entirely virtually. Now let's talk about the mindset. Is the mindset to actually create opportunities to do those kind of things and leverage the assets you have? People like you coming into the organizations that want to make a difference, want to have an impact? Or is the mindset, no, I can't use technology, can't use social media? Don't think about you know, what I'll call the pop cultural issues that actually might make it a little bit more fun and exciting. 
people that have the right mindset will actually, again, survive and thrive. And it is that mindset issue that is going to make organizations be much better and the people in them much better. And that's why even today, yesterday, they are hiring and hiring a lot. But you don't hear about that from a media perspective. You don't hear that from the data point perspective. Flip this around now, let's talk about you. Technology, leadership, and you. And I want to give you some thoughts around how does this all relate to you. This concept of leadership is not one that comes with a title. Leadership is something that, in fact, people aspire to do and are capable of doing regardless of what level they are, what title they have, their background, or whatever the case may be. And that's why, again, when we did this challenge, this innovation challenge that we just talked about, we want to inspire people that don't have the title, that literally are first-year person to step up and actually lead by example, create teams around them, diverse teams, come up with a great idea, and yes, for us to recognize them. But what does it take to be successful? So let me hit on a couple of things for a second. So you understand the things that we think about as we think about the talent in our organization. And I'm putting it into four categories. You might have heard some of them before, but let me give you some examples. I'm gonna call it the IQ, the CQ, the EQ, and the PQ. We'll all know what the IQ element is. The intelligence quotient that each one of you have, and can only, you have it better than I ever did based upon the grade point average you guys had to get into the school. Trust me on that. I was told about your SAT scores and your GPAs, and trust me, I was never at that level. <laughs> That's only jacks are better to get in the game. You need to think about the other quotients that are equally as important for people to evolve and lead. The next one that people typically talk about is what I'll call the emotional quotient. Right? So these are the soft skills that are needed. Communication style. The ability to bond and trust one another. To create the opportunity for people to come with you and you to lead them. It is those softer things. It's the personality test. It's all that stuff. It's hard to find, but you know it when you see it. That people become leaders, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're born with it. It doesn't mean necessarily you've got to have it. Because I can tell you, when I was at your age, there's no way in hell I had it. I was that introvert. I was not the one creating teams. I did not go out there and lead by example. But it's stuff that over your lifetime you understand and create. IQ and EQ are the things that people typically talk about today. CQ and PQ are the things they typically don't. CQ is the cultural quotient. In a global organization, when you think about that word globalization, and the ability to connect with one another on a global basis to understand their biases, their preferences, the way they do business, whatever it may be, you need to have an appreciation of what it's like to operate in that country, in that city, in that region. And the world we live in today, this concept of operating globally, is not just focused on the IBMs of the world, or the Fidelities of the world, or the Barclays of the world, or the British Airways of the world. It's everywhere. <coughs> the smallest company sitting in Cincinnati has outsourced their back office to somebody. Their supply chain comes from Africa, or India, or Brazil. Their ultimate customer is sitting out in Indonesia, or Malaysia, or Russia. So this concept of just the big multinationals being global, BS. Everybody's going global. And for people to succeed and thrive and continue to do the things they need to do, they've got to have that CQ quotient in their organization somewhere. Now let's talk for a second. I'm going to give you a real life example again, maybe about myself and my time in Japan. So when I went to Japan, again, I grew up on the financial services side of our business. I was an auditor. What's an auditor to do? An auditor asks questions. What are you doing? Why are you doing it that way? Does it make sense? And you're checking the financial records of organizations. So the first thing I do in three weeks into the job is actually work on a French bank called Bank of the Suez, which has subsequently emerged. So not many of you would have heard of it. But I remember reading through our papers 
that a five, ten million dollar loan hasn't been paid off. Interest or principal. Natural tenants go up and say, what's going on here? Why isn't there a bad debt allowance? Why hasn't it been written off? What's going on? I try to talk to the staff. Now back then the staff in Japan was taught to read and write English but not speak it. A little hard to do your job when you can't speak the language. Finally figured out what the staff said is, we talked to Mr. Suzuki about that loan. Mr. Suzuki says, everything's okay, no problem. So again, the natural antennas go up, and I say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Let's go talk to Mr. Suzuki. Mr. Suzuki doesn't speak English, so we bring a translator. We go to see Mr. Suzuki. About a 30-minute conversation. The only thing I know in that conversation is I am getting cursed out in Japanese. <laughs> I'm three weeks in Japan, typical any new language, you figure out what are the right words, the first words were the ones I learned. I know I'm getting cursed out in Japanese. We walk out of the meeting with the translator, and the translator goes, oh, Maritzan, very bad meeting. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I understand that, but what happened? Oh, Maritzan, you need to understand. You were questioning his authority. You're an American questioning his authority. You're a young American questioning his authority. Three strikes and you're out. And now all of a sudden it clicks. How am I going to do my job in a culture where authority, tenure, and title are really important and you can't ask questions to question the authority or question what they do? So now I need to think about with that CQ, how can I do my job in an environment where something is totally different and not do it the way I used to do it in the States? To make matters worse, I remember leaving the meeting. It was like the next day I went to go see the CFO. CFO was a French guy, Roy. I said, Roy, you know, I just sat a meeting with Mr. Suzuki. And he goes, oh, yeah, we heard all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I had, I had this discussion with him about this receivable. Didn't go very well. You know, he doesn't speak English. I had a French translator. Roy stops me, dead in my tracks, and says, Bob, Mr. Suzuki speaks perfect English. He just didn't want to speak it to you. <laughs> Now you have another element of the cultural quotient. I've just been discriminated against. You go back to that concept of diversity and inclusiveness, man, there's a wake up call that probably didn't hit me for another years, two, 10 years later. I was the minority in Japan. I'll never in the US be thought of as something other than the white male. But man, you felt like somebody that had a bias against them sitting in Japan at the time. And it's as close as I will ever come to that. That's what I mean by the cultural quotient in terms of the IQ and the smarts to understand the technical stuff, the EQ to think about how do you create a team, lead a team, and the like, and the CQ, CQ to be what I'll call understanding enough to know how to operate the scenes and do what you need to do when people come from different backgrounds, business cultures, ethics, responsibility, and the like. Jump to the PQ for a second, because this is something that is not talked about enough at all today. I'll call it the passion quotient. Do people have the passion quotient when they are passionate about something significantly enough that they are bringing the intellectual curiosity? They're willing to put some time and energy to invest in themselves, to actually go out and lead and make a difference and have an impact, as opposed to just getting stuff done. And I will tell you out of all three things, when we're looking at talent today, that's probably the most impactful thing that we're looking for. Are people waking up excited to do something and make a difference? Are people willing to actually put themselves out there and do it? Are they actually willing to make the investment, bring the passion each and every day to be relevant, be valuable, and actually deliver the goods? Someone asked me a question, and I do this, I visit probably three or four schools a year. And I typically ask the question, what does it take to be successful? And, and what I would say is that when you look at our people, you're going to come in in that first year and be asked to do a series of tasks. If you're on the tax side, it might be to check out the tax provision. If you Come in on the audit side, it might be to check the accounts receivable and see if it makes sense. If you're on the consulting side, it might be working on a project to help with the systems implementation or an HR redesign. The question for you all is going to be, are you going to come in and just do that task 
are you going to think bigger? Because I'll tell you, in one bucket, the person who does the task and does it well will be fine. But the person that's sitting over here that actually takes the time to say, I've got this task in front of me. Why don't I call 10 other teams and find out what they do? Why don't I actually think about what kind of questions I want to ask the equivalent of Mr. Suzuki to make a positive impression? How can I actually bring together a team that's diverse that actually make me better and actually give them additional exposure? How can I walk in and make the best impression possible when I'm asking those questions? How can I get the information and do it in a timely way? And actually, when I'm done with it, I do a quality job, and there's a list of 15 improvements that I not only share with the team that's going to follow me, but the other 10 teams I've talked to. And I'm going to make them better as much as I am going to make myself better. That's the PQ. That's the difference from those that actually understand the rest of the equations and actually make a difference. Because they are not thinking about just themselves. They're thinking of bigger. They're thinking about how can they improve themselves, create opportunities for themselves, manage their careers, but also have an impact on all those people. Yes, those same people that are right now to the left and to the right here. And that's the kind of skill set we're looking for. So we think about mindset. And I embedded that within the conversation around technology, the conversation around leadership. In terms of do people have the right mindset to have that? That's the kind of things that we're looking for. That's the quotient. That's the intangible that is going to make a difference that we're looking for anytime we interview you, we see you on campus, we see you at the barbecue that we just had outside, or even for that matter, the questions you ask in here. Those are the things that every organization is looking for. Every organization. Some are better than others of seeing the emerging trends to find that talent, develop that talent, deploy that talent to make you successful. Now, before we go to questions, let me give you another couple of pieces of advice as we think about now the individuals. You all. As some of you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about the individuals we're recruited to the organization, the brand we're trying to bring, and ultimately deliver to all of our stakeholders. And equally important in that brand definition is your personal brand and how you actually make it better so you'd be more successful later on. And let's share with you three stories. So here's one story that blew me away when I first heard it. First year staff accountant worked at a job, this was back a number of decades. They're in an office, we were actually given some space for the client to talk to and do the work from. And in that particular place, way back when, when we didn't have as much technology, you had inner office mail. A male person would bring along an envelope and say, here's your mail. And a snail mail was given to somebody. That male person actually connected with that first year staff account. They connected with them, developed a friendship. That male person got promoted, started working in the infrastructure. Male person got promoted again, got to middle management. That male person again got promoted seven more times and ultimately became the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Now, great storyline in terms of the IQ, the CQ, the EQ, and the PQ for that individual. <coughs> Lesson learned for us? Are you bumping into male people right now, or the equivalent of male people, and developing a relationship with them? Does that, I can tell you that CEO, whenever we had to pitch an idea, or whenever we had a problem, the person that was that first year staff accountant was the person we called because they had goodwill and trust for that CEO. Lesson number one, manage those relationships. Expand your network. Take advantage of it. Don't lose sight of it. Story number two, in the UK firm, the equivalent organization that we have, we actually have a couple different buildings. In one of the buildings, there's a security guard on the payroll. His name is John Brown. John Brown one day sees a client come in fairly early. The client just came in and came off a red eye. And John Brown says to him, what can I do for you? He goes, I'm here for a client pitch. You guys are going to pitch me on a piece of work. I'm here about an hour and a half early. Is there any place to shower off? And John goes, yeah, there is actually. I'll walk you down there. John walks him down there. The guy goes, takes a shower, gets dressed up, everything else, and comes out of the the facilities, and there's breakfast waiting for this guy. John went out of his way and bought the breakfast, 
orange juice, coffee, and the like. What we didn't know was John was coming up to the room, and between the hours of 8.30 and 10.30, because we were supposed to pitch at 11, we actually walked in at 11, and he said to us, you guys with PwC? Yes. You guy downstairs, John Brown, is he with PwC? Yes. He goes, we're done. <laughs> he said, if your organization is treating me that way as the security guard just treated me, and that's consistent for your organization, you've already won the work. And oh, by the way, in the last hour and a half, I called your competitors and told them we're done. You're not going to hear from me today. Again, how many people are you walking into that are security guards? And maybe, oh, by the way, when you do your campus tours, or you're meeting new freshmen coming in, or yeah, you're talking to your faculty, are you thinking about that mentality? And the third thing I will tell you is, one of the things I tell our staff is, your challenge is to walk into every opportunity, every opportunity, as if it was an interview for something else. And your job is to impress everybody that you meet so much so that they want to hire you. And what I tell our people is, I don't want you to take a job. <laughs> But man, I want your brand to be so good, so good that they are willing to hire you. So story number three, so J.P. Morgan Chase is my, was, was my client. I went on it twice. He tried to hire me three times. And when I came back from Japan in 1994, I came back as a senior manager. I hopefully made a partner on that job. And we're actually going through partner transition. And the client, J.P. Morgan, said, hey, why can't Bob be the partner of the job? And my firm turned around and said, mm, not too sure about that, pretty young. And my CEO at the time ended up talking to their CEO at the time about whether I could, should, and would take on the ultimate responsibility for that. At that point, that was a really good account. And the answer ultimately said, yes. Now, it was also that same CEO that tried to hire me twice. So it was really easy to be sought after and take on that role regardless of age because the impressions I made were positive enough that they wanted to hire me. Never took the job, but they wanted to hire me. That's the personal brand. That's the network aspects of how you have to think about your personal brand. So lesson number one, take advantage of those networks. Nurture them. Spend the time investing them. Lesson number two, your personal brand, more so than when I grew up, and any generation before me, is absolutely defined online. Be smart about that. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's still an asset. The mindset should not be shut it down. The mindset should be it's an asset, use it, leverage it, turn it into your advantage. But do it in a really smart way. Third lesson. Take a risk. Ask for feedback. Do something out of the ordinary. Get out of your comfort zone. Me going to Japan, I would argue, was probably the biggest, most impactful thing that I ever did. And again, not having a passport, I can remember literally the day I said yes. Someone came up to me and said, you speak Japanese? No. You like sushi? No. You like sleeping in short beds, albeit stereotypical? No. <laughs> but those were the questions I was asked for a guy that never went literally west of the Mississippi. But man, that was a huge risk. But turn it into advantage both professionally and personally. Get to meet a lot of people from a network perspective. Travel around socially and see what's going on. Take advantage of climbing Mount Fuji. Make the most of the opportunities you're given, but take that risk. Get out of your comfort zone and challenge the status quo. Next piece of advice, don't be so naive and don't have such a big ego that you shouldn't or won't ask for help or coaching. I shared it with some of the people I met earlier today. One of the biggest lessons learned for me over the last five years has probably been the issue of how do you actually become more real, more open, with a degree of humility. Here's what I mean by that. I shared this before to a couple other people, but when I went on JP Morgan, I needed to know it all the first time. I went on there twice. I needed to know it all. I took great pride 
in knowing it all, at the demise of my team knowing it all. And the second time around when I did the job, I couldn't physically know it all. At that time, J.P. Morgan had worked with Chase, with Chemical, with Bank One, Jamie Dimon was the president. There was no way in the world I could know it all anymore because that institution became so large. What it caused me to do was actually leverage the people around me. And yes, at times admit, I don't know. Let me check, I'll get back to it. Caused me to admit, I need help. I'm not as smart at having the answers all the time, every single time. Compared to years earlier, when I did actually probably have the alpha male ego of saying I could do it all. You want to create a bond, you want to leverage that network, you better open yourself up a little bit. You better put your guard down a little bit. You better be willing to share. Because again, as a leader, you need others to do the same. And you rule from the front. You're the role model, no matter what the title is, you're rolling from the front. Meaning, you set the tone at the top, you got to walk the talk, and if you don't, why will anybody else do it? They won't. So as you think about your own time here on campus, when you think about the times in the clubs or on the jobs or in the internships that you're thinking about, just pause and reflect. Because the day-to-day -day firefighting gets in the way. Pause and reflect and say, am I doing all I can to enhance my own personal brand? Because that's when people will be seeking you out. That's when people want you on their payroll. That's when you'll get the opportunities because people will be willing to mentor you, to sponsor you, to take a risk on you, and get in front of you to actually give you the opportunities that they have. That's the difference. That's how people are successful as you sit here today. Now, before I open up for questions, a couple of things about what we're trying to accomplish at PwC. And again, I will answer anything and everything. And we've got a lot of time to do this. But if you look at our organization today, again, we're about 35,000 people in the US, we're about 178,000 people worldwide. You provide audit services, tax services, you provide consulting services, deal activity, and the like. But what we are doing is growing aggressively because there is a need out there for our services. What we are doing is adding talent to our organizations, either through increasing our college recruiting, making acquisitions, stealing talent from the competition, but whatever it is, we've got to increase our headcount to serve and be the best you can be in terms of the quality of the service that you can bring, be the best you possibly can bring in terms of the top line growth and the bottom line growth, and the top line is literally double digits in a really tough economic environment. But equal as important is to have an impact and create opportunities for our people. The reality is in our profession, this is a springboard for many, many other things. It's up to the individuals, both you as you sit in the role and us to help facilitate it, to figure out where it is you want to spring to and ultimately succeed, personally and professionally. And there are lots of people that have left us to be successful. There's lots of people that have stayed with us and been successful. There are lots of people that have left us, shown somewhere else and come back and been successful. The biggest thing we're trying to do is to have relationships with our key stakeholders, our clients, their boards, investors, standard setters and regulators, our people, our future people, the academics, and the like to make sure we have a relationship with them and the value they get, they get, not we get, but they get from us is meaningful to them. Which leads me to the last piece of advice. You can't walk into any organization thinking that they will do it for you. It's a two-way street. You gotta open up and say, here's what I wanna do. Here's the investment I will make going forward. Here's the things I'm willing to sacrifice. What will the firm or the organization do for me? And let me give you a couple of examples of storytelling around this. So first one, um, I'm on JP Morgan again, like I said, I'm the partner on the job. A woman by the name of Jessica comes in to see me and says, I want to go to France. Yeah, I want a million dollars too, but I'm not sure how I can get to it tomorrow. But the reality is Jessica had heard me talk about Japan and said, hey, I want to go to France. 
I said, Jessica, I'm not going to help you. And she looked at me and she said, why? I said, I'll tell you what. Let me put it to you this way. I'm more than happy to help. If you can actually tell me why is it good for you, why is it good for the client, why is it good for a company of PwC here in the U.S. and here in <coughs> Take your time. We'll think about that question and come back to it. She took about two weeks. She talked to a lot of people. She came back. Boom, boom, boom. Knocked the ball out of the park. I said, Jessica, no problem. You got it. I'm going to call up Etienne, who I met while I was in Japan. I'm going to come back to that network. We'll give you some time and get you over there. Call up Etienne Boris. Here's the opportunity. Here's this woman, Jessica. Here's what she's done. Here's her background. Here's her interest. Yes, I'm sponsoring her for going overseas. Jessica leaves, comes back, does a look-see, says I'm going to move over there for two to three years. Jessica has succeeded, stayed there, gotten married there, had kids, and been successful in our firm as a result. But it wasn't Jessica just expecting the firm to give her something. It was, what do you have to put into it and speak up? Second challenge, second story, how do you manage work-life flexibility? And I want to be very focused on those words. Flexibility, not balance. Because actually what we offer is flexibility between the personal and the professional side, not necessarily on any given day balance. Big difference. And the reality is, again, here people need to speak up. What's important to you? And I'll tell another story where I remember I was in a role at the time, and, and someone called me up and said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you call such and such tomorrow morning? He just worked all night to put together this proposal. He missed his daughter's birthday. And I listen to this, and I'm pissed. you got to be kidding me. Why would somebody have to work all night when you got a whole team of people around them? that this person has to miss their daughter's birthday. So next day I'm ready to make the phone call. I want to call this person up and apologize or anything else. And the team calls me up and says, don't make the phone call. And I say, why? Well, such and such never told us it was his daughter's birthday. I don't know if it was the male legal in the wave saying, I got to be at the center of attention, or I got to prove myself, or this is what I want to do, and there's a personal choice in that. But he never told us that. And now I'm upset for two reasons. One is because he never told us that. So where's the relationship, where's the trust? Second is, where's my team in creating the environment that there's enough knowledge to know personally, here's what's going on. Because the PwC value chain is all around the investments in the relationship and understanding people as if they were family. Which leads me to the last story. As I think about it, I shared with the team I just met with previously. I've had a number of job opportunities, as I said. And again, JP Morgan came after me three different times. One of the times they did that, the CEO personally said, come on over, I want to talk to you. The CFO tried to pitch me. I was still in the new mode. And I remember the guy who called me up who was their COO. He said, Bob, come on over. I knew him well. He actually looked, he worked for one of the big eight years ago. We had been successful in this place. Came over and closed the door and says, I've been asked by the CEO to recruit you. He says, if that's what you want, I will do that and I will help make you successful. That's the relationship we had. But before you make that decision, Bob, you need to know something. And what you need to know is the grass is not always greener. What you need to know is, I've seen your organization, because we actually invited him, his wife, his family to a number of different events over the years. He's spoken at conferences. He's been part of our, our workshops. He's actually trained some of our people, so he knew the fabric of our organization. He says, what you guys got is more family than anything I will ever have here. So much so that if I had to actually invite a bunch of people to my kid's wedding, there's maybe one or two, one or two that I invite. And my guess, Bob, is that in your organization, you would struggle to actually narrow it down to who you're not going to invite. If that's what you want, again, I will help you. I will make you successful. You will be successful. But we never had this conversation, so don't tell the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to make sure you had the facts before you made the decision. Let's come back to how we started. Leadership, technology, mindset. His mindset was around the relationship that I had with him first. The trust that was between the two of us regardless of the business obligations that were there, and we were always interested in one another. 
and actually doing the right thing for one another and eventually the organization as a whole. He went out of his way to take that risk, that personal brand that I talked about. Because we had their network, because we had their relationship, because we actually trusted one another. Anytime we need something, I deliver. What's going to make us successful? Quality work, think bigger, leverage that network, and deliver each and every day. Those are the core values that are going to enable you to be successful. And I don't care if you go with the government, corporate world, not for profit, your own private entrepreneurial exercise. Stick around on campus to teach whatever it may be. But those are the core values of what's really important. Now, I am sweating my backside on here with the jacket on, so I'm going to take that off. I'm going to answer questions. What I think we've got is a, think a couple of microphones yeah. around the table. And again, like I said, folks, the idea was to educate you a little bit around career to give you context, a little bit about what we're seeing in the business community, what it takes to be successful, and now this is all about you. So I'm happy to take anything that Okay, um, so the question that's come from the overflow room, and we'll try to get some others as well as the ones in the audience here is what characteristics of an intern or employee do you think stands out? You know, as I said earlier, when you go to that IQ, CQ, PQ, and EQ, particularly, particularly at the intern level in that first year, it is that PQ. That intellectual curiosity to know more, to explore the world of the possible, to think about what else is out there. They're not, they're not afraid to ask the questions and actually introduce themselves. They're actually willing to say, I don't know what I really want, but I'm willing to actually explore 15 things, figure out how to get there. That's the kind of passion that we want to see in the interns. That's the kind of things that we see in successful people within reason. And I mean that sincerely, within reason. Again, think about, just like with us, what it's like to be sitting on the other side of the table when you put those desks out there. Think about the two-way relationship, because it can't just be all about you, but doing it in a respectful way, asking the right kind of questions, demonstrating that interest that desire, but doing it in a non-threatening way or a non-over-the-top way is equally as important as actually doing it itself. Other questions? Up in the back there. We have um, just one microphone. Again, if people can just raise their hand and we'll get a microphone so this way we can maximize the time. Go ahead. Where do you stand on an audit of the Federal Reserve and how do you respond to the quote if we ever allow a central bank to inflate and deflate the money supply, our children will grow up homeless on the continent our forefathers conquered, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> so let's go backwards in your question. Um, I think the role and responsibility of the Federal Reserve, which is obviously in a really precautious place right now in terms of regulation, policy setting, and monetary policy is one that has worked fairly well over the last couple of decades, centuries, and life. So I don't believe, and this is a personal point of view, I don't believe at all that we have to separate the roles and responsibilities of that organization. I do believe that that organization has got to do a much better job of being consistent with what its monetary policies are doing versus what its regulatory policies are doing, versus the other standards and processes and procedures that they put in place. Here's what I mean by that. Now, I grew up in the financial services space. Um, at the time the crisis started, I had met with every individual CEO on Wall Street. And every individual CEO had a different point of view around monetary issues versus regulatory issues. But what was clear was from a monetary perspective, we wanted to actually ease the interest rates environment allowed for access to credit, but at the same time, they were telling every bank, you've got to get capital up. And that mixed message is what is, in fact, I would argue, killing the entrepreneurial spirit because we don't have that sense of certainty in terms of what's the game that's being played and what are the rules that are being played on it. So if your latter question, I'm not too worried about the role of the Fed thinking about the monetary policy issue. Now go to the issue of audits of the Fed. And I want to dissect it in two ways. 
The role of the audit around financial information is needed today and will be needed tomorrow. The role of an audit in providing assurance around other information that derives and drives value will be needed going forward, and I do think you'll see the role of the auditor change. We have not changed that product, that audit opinion, in the last 70 years. And I do believe, in fact, I'm actually working on a project right now on behalf of the profession to say what should be that role going forward. If the public really believes that it needs to have an audit of the Fed, the first question is, of what? Because the audit of the Fed actually is already done in terms of the financial information that they provide, set up consolidated financial accounts. The lawyer actually does that. The audit of the expenditures of the Fed is, yes, audited today. There's no public report that comes out, but the Inspector General actually does that today. So now you get into the question of what's the information you want audited and who should do it, and do they have credibility in doing it? And I will tell you that as you think about not just that agency, but a lot of other agencies, you actually have to think about who's asking, what do they want, and ultimately who should be delivering that assurance or that accessation of the information that's there. It is one of the biggest challenges we have today because as you think about the role of the auditor, and I'm going to come back to us in a second, getting investors, preparers, regulators, lawyers, everybody else lined up to say what's really important is really hard. If I brought a group of investors together today, and I'm going to take it at a corporate level, they would all say I want more information. When you ask them the question of what information, you lose consensus. When you ask them at what level of information you want, you lose consensus. When you ask them what are you really interested in, there's confusion because you've got 15 different types of investors, day traders, long-term value traders, etc. So coming back to your question, do we need more audits? You need different audits going forward. And then whether you need an audit of the Fed, I think comes back to what's the information really that the public deserves and needs. And I'm not convinced yet we've got consensus on that. So until we think through and ultimately decide who wants it and why do they want it? No, I don't think you need an audit of the Fed right now until we get that certainty nailed down because it's an open book and believe me, that is a hell of a cost of investment. Of course. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Others? Can we take another from the other room still, too? Or? Uh, yeah, we'll have a couple. Okay, go ahead. You've been able to grow in a down economy and I wonder if you could share what you think the reasons for that successful are, and also are there any lessons for the broader economy in terms of job growth? So we've been able to grow in a down economy, I think, for three primary reasons. Um, one is the service that we provide um, is needed more so than even in more certain terms. So if you look today, the conversations I'll have with CEOs, CFOs, COOs, IT people, HR people, Tell me what it is that I should be doing differently to survive this uncertainty out there. Tell me what my competition is doing without giving away proprietary secrets and help me do it. As opposed to you know, having a strategy and going forward because a lot of CEOs, if you look, the tenure of those CEOs and even CFOs is relatively short. So they are looking for more help. So I think that creates opportunity. Second thing that's happened is proposed rules, proposed regulations, <coughs> may be bad from an economic perspective, but actually good from consulting firms, auditors, and tax professionals. Because what's out there, what does it mean, how do I comply with it, et cetera. So even today, if you think about uh, taxes, and obviously the president and the administration have put out there a couple of ideas, I'll call them the spaghetti test, because we're throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks. Um, all the companies are saying, number one, I'm not going to put headcount on my payroll to figure it out. So I'll hire you to do a small project. I've got governments around the world trying to attack my revenue stream because I need money to deal with all my budget deficits. So I've got all kinds of arguments amongst uh, tax agencies. And I need scenarios in terms of what's the order of the possible, what might happen, and then how should I actually change my organizational structure to get there. So issue number two is how do you operate in these increased regulatory and uh, other rulemaking bodies. The third thing is how do you remain relevant? because the word relevant is really important to the buyer of the service. So what do I mean by that? As an organization, we probably did a great job, I'd argue, around the audit stuff. We did a great job on the tax stuff. And in the consulting space, we already had critical mass in dealing with regulation, cost management, deal activity, fraud activity, and investigations. 
But in a world order today where most of corporate America has done a fairly decent job of managing and taking costs out, the bigger issue is how do you actually increase revenue? So I now need skills to actually be more relevant to the CEOs and CFOs. And that's why we've done some of the acquisitions that we've done. That's why actually some of the people we're bringing in bring a totally different perspective. And let me give you an example. So the kind of companies we just acquired are dealing with strategy and operations but with a technology bent to them. And you say to yourself, what does that mean exactly? Well, I'm an insurance company that actually offers um, homeowners insurance. And I think about my customer segmentation. Now I'm going to leverage technology to create a better customer experience. How can I use this, right? Or my iPhone, or a Droid, or Blackberry to give not only the information on a quote for homeowners insurance, but I'll set up data requirements where you call me up and say, hey, I'm going to buy a house at 225 Cross Lane. How much is the insurance? Well, now that organization in a heartbeat is telling me, well, did you buy the house yet? No. Well, there are 10 other houses in that area for X price with the same kind of characteristics. Here's the insurance quote for all 10, not just the one you're interested in. And all of a sudden now, I've got technology enablement on a customer experience that will create loyalty and move the ball forward. We need to do the same, and we need to be relevant in that space now. So now I go back to what's the lesson learned from a broader economics perspective, particularly here in the States. Number one, I would argue, personal point of view again, that we, the States, have gone through a cycle where now the question is that we have government and business working together to say, what is it we now want to be known for? You are a huge manufacturer. That's one global. You went into financial services and into tech. That's one global. You had energy. That's home global. What's next for the states where business and, court and, and government are working together to say this is the next area of competitive advantage that the U.S. wants to have so we can actually have the workforce be relevant to that service and actually have the world look and say, do we in fact, are we relevant to the global economy and are we doing something different through innovation, quality, and light to make sure we're doing a great job? and to create that growth agenda that ultimately, I think, will create jobs and create a sustained uh, economic uh, result. So I do think we've got to get our act together. What are those things that can we can work together and remain relevant to the global economy, not just the US economy? And on the last point I would say on this one is we have to have more context of what we're doing. I shared this uh, with a group earlier. There's a particular CEO that I talk to on a regular basis of a uh, a famous company, a logistics company, and he's a great data point because he sees what's happening in the world in terms of moving merchandise, for lack of a better word, out there on a worldwide basis. And he's very big into cap and trade issues. And he's bringing people over to China, congressmen and women, senators and the like over to China. He's trying to get a contingency group of about 35 people, of which 60% of the people he was trying to bring did not have passports. So if you look at that statistic and say, how are we actually making relevant rules to operate in a global economy? How can you do that without an appreciation of what's going on in the global economy? So this issue of relevancy, I think, is another big lesson learned for us to think about. Um, the second story I will tell you in that regard is that I met with a series of senators. This is probably about six months ago, I guess it was. And the particular senator and the chief of staff was asking you know, about a particular rule. And I said, listen, before you even get into that rule, if you're Thinking about that rule to protect the borders and the investment protection rights of US registrants and the US investors. Number one, I just met with six foreign CEOs in the last three weeks, all of which are seeing the US as a great opportunity to get talent, buy assets, or buy companies because of the uncertainty that's here. And second, you probably have talked to, for example, the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange that continues to say, you know, the rulemaking is killing us. But the reality is that CEO of the Stock Exchange three decades ago literally was a single center for capital. And in the global world we are living in today, it's just as easy to get capital in Beijing, Shanghai, down in South Africa, or anywhere else. So the rulemaking has to be put into context, if in fact we're going to operate more globally. Last story I'll tell you on that one is we did a study, and it was more of a scenario plan years ago. I guess about five years ago that we shared with our partners. 
we bring them together every couple of years. And we put out four scenarios when we looked at the world order. What's the role of the U.S. was the question. Will the U.S. lead the way it has in the past? Will it convene other countries going forward and be a leader of the convened group? Will certain emerging countries actually blow us by, or will the rest of the world blow us by? And there was a little bit of truth in all four of those things, but it gave you a different appreciation for some of the things that have happened. And I argue today, if you look at the economic crisis over the last three years, it has, in essence, put on steroids all the stuff that we knew was going to happen. It just has happened and has been accentuated by the economic events that have happened over the last three years. So I don't know if that helps, but it gives you some context in terms of what's going on. Others? I think we have time for one last very quick question. I'm here as long as you need me to be here. <laughs> uh, so Mr. Moritz, as a college Bob. <laughs> uh, Bob, as a college kid, um, looking at, we're seeing globalization, we're seeing the IFRS transformation, we're seeing technology, we're seeing XDRL, and we're seeing the rebranding of these companies coming out with, you know, PwC is no longer Price Waterhouse, it's vibrant, it's new. What would you say, how would you, like, say we should utilize the IQ, the PQ, the CQ, and enter the workforce? I mean, what do we do to... Um. So let me comment on a couple things you said and then respond to your question. Um, sitting in the shoes I'm sitting in today, the brand of PwC changed for a couple of reasons. We changed it because actually we branded ourselves 12 years ago when we merged the PwC with the, the Cooper side. And on a global basis, actually, every one of our countries sort of did their own thing. So we don't have a consistent brand. That was opportunity number one. Opportunity number two was Pricewaterhouse Coopers doesn't translate well in Asia. A lot of letters, doesn't translate too well. It's really hard to say. And I'll share a story really quickly on that. I, I was working on a client, a financial services client. It's a time where one of the hedge funds was going down and they went over to the UK, had to work on something, they wanted me back right away in the US, so they actually put me on the Concord when we had the Concord. And on the Concord was Richard Branson. Now think about that for a second. If people understand what Richard Branson is coming out of Virgin, why is he sitting on a British Airway Concord? And the Concord, of course, I ever went on one, very small plane. And I went up to use a restaurant, and he literally comes right up behind me. And I looked at him and said, what are you doing on this plane, man? It's free advertising. And he turned and said, it's the quickest way I can get to the States. I've got to actually do a deposition in front of your Congress, and I've got to get back. And I looked at him again and said, man, I would put a bag over your head, because you work in free advertising in you know, British Air. He looked at me and goes, well, who do you work for? I said, Price Waterhouse Cooper's an attorney. He goes, oh, the longest winded name company in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good for us to actually sort of rebrand the name. Um, the third reason we changed the brand was because Price Waterhouse Cooper's, the way we set up the logo, is not too dynamic online. Again, going back to this theory of technology, it's got to be more dynamic. Um, and the last thing I would tell you is we're at a point where the colors, the vibrancy of that, the dynamic aspect of that logo is really important because it conveys a couple of things. But well, one of them is the average age of our place is 27. Average age is 27. Our job is to make this place feel as exciting as Apple. And that is no joke. That is the challenge in terms of you want to be a talent magnet. And I don't know if it's Apple today or Apple tomorrow. How do you actually make the place energetic enough to be able to attract that talent? The world of technology will change the products we deliver. The audit opinion, I think, will be much different five years from now. I think it'll be different again 10 years from now. I think it'll be different 20 years from now. When you think about now you coming into that workforce, as I said earlier, the job is to bring all four, that IQ, that PQ, that CQ, that EQ. But again, wake up and think about your personal brand. Make sure that you walk in and try to impress the hell out of the people that are there. And that's us, the current employees, that's us, the clients that you interact with, and that is us, your fellow employees. And the reason for that is for you to make an impact, to be relevant, etc. you want to be sought after. You want people to come find you. And when you have that, you're now a source of knowledge. When you have that, you're a valued asset. When you have that, you've got the world of opportunities in front of you. And when you have that, 
you are in charge of your own career destiny. That's what we want to do when you walk in our doors. I'm going to end on that note. So thanks so much. For